All right, so uh, this are today's topics. It seems that it's a lot, but a bit of each. Yeah, that's what we are doing. As I said, we talk about deformation and you will see what is the difference between deformation, which you all understand, and stress. Yeah, uh, and strain, sorry, not stress, and strain. Deformation and strain, because you see this word deformation here and you see the word strain, yeah, strain. So uh, let's go through it. And this is from the textbook, uh, but I think it is a very good picture. So that's why I took it and I say, look, we all will, will be uh, conversant in geology, yeah? We, we need to understand geology, this is our objective. And when you go in the field, you are going to see rocks like this. This uh, looks to me like a gneiss, yeah? And it is folded gneiss. Now, you haven't studied petrology, but gneiss is a metamorphic rock. So it was metamorphosed, changed from an initial rock, which can be anything. Could, could be a sedimentary rock, an igneous rock, you know, igneous rocks like plutonic and volcanic, or a metamorphic rock. And because the rocks get buried and submitted to increasing temperature and pressure, they get transformed. The minerals lose water and they recrystallize and form new minerals and a new form of packing. So you get these metamorphic rocks like gneiss. Yeah. So this is the result of more intense metamorphosis. And you see in this gneiss, you see what is called gneissic bending, because you see these bands, this separation of mafic minerals, like here, mafic minerals, and felsic minerals. Mafic means dark, yeah, negro, and felsic means white, yeah, so light color. Yeah, that is the idea. So when you look at this rock, it seems as if the rock flowed somehow, but obviously it was deformed, yeah? So it suffered the deformation. And this is what in structural geology is our aim to understand how things got deformed, yeah? So you can imagine, you see here, you see here the definition that we are looking at the transformation. You had an initial geometry and the final geometry. And the question is how this happened. And you see here, you see here two uh, categories of deformation. One is called a rigid body deformation. So a rigid body de deformation is that if you have a thing, like I have this book, you can move it and this is translation. Yeah, translation. Now imagine this is a part, uh, a volume of rock and it gets moved. So that is translation. So just the whole volume moves, so the vectors of movement are all parallel and equal. Or it can rotate, and that is rotation. But this is a rigid body. This is rigid, nothing affected this volume. Now, when you have the deformation of rocks, you have a part of the formation that is non-rigid body deformation. That means that this gets all squished and crumpled and so on, deformed, yeah? But this is strain. So a car, when a car gets into the, an accident, that is strain because you see it all crumpled, yeah? So we can basically think about the deformation in terms of translation, rotation, and then distortion, yeah? Distortion of the volume. And you can imagine that here we are looking at all these aspects, yeah? So. This is why we use the word strain when we, we talk about distortion, distortion. But I don't know what the word for strain is in Espanol. So that's why I'm taking classes that I need to get to a higher level to be able to teach uh, students in Spanish. So this, uh, is nothing, there is nothing complicated here. What, what this shows, it shows 
for instance, a rotation. Yeah, this is a rotation. You, you see this square and it gets rotated. You see this in terms of translation. For instance, here is some distortion. Yeah, you see strain. And this is a very important category of distortion called simple strain. So basically, you, you deform like this. So that's how uh, uh, in simple shear, sorry. This is why we have what's called shear zones. Yeah, so the deformation, you see how it goes. And here at the bottom, you have something that is called pure shear. So you basically squish something like this, yeah, pure shear. And you have something in between where you have a combination of simple shear with pure shear. So at the same time, you do simple shear and pure shear, yeah? So this is a thing. And what this shows, we can try to understand these deformations in terms of a displacement field. So these vectors show the initial position of a point. You see this point, this corner got here. So this is a vector that described the movement of translation. And here the same, here the same, and so, so on. So basically the displacement field shows you the initial state and the final state. It doesn't tell you anything about the history of movement. Yeah, the history of movement, you don't know it. All you know is this is the initial state, this is a final point of uh, where the each each particle got moved but how it moved the the pathway you don't know it so the pathway is described here you see the particle paths are like little parts of circles yeah these arcs these arcs here in this case so you see the particle paths so you see how the particle paths uh, differ for instance here in the case of pure shear you see this tells us the history, and this tells us only the initial and the final, yeah? So you can think about the rocks in terms of, do you want to understand, okay, it got deformed from what state initially to what we see today, or you want to understand the whole history of deformation. So these are two different things, and structural geologists, uh, some of them look only at the initial, try to understand the initial state, some of our structural geologists try to understand the whole history of the formation. All right, so this is the idea. So this is the same. So this is for, taken from the textbook. You will have time to, to read it, but it basically shows you, again, it shows you something that here seems a very complicated uh, deformation. You see, you start with this square with a circle in it, and you end up with this. And you see here the displacement vectors, yeah? So initial state, final state. Now, when you look at this total deformation, yeah, you can decompose it into these parts. One is translation, yeah? So you see every particle has moved in the same direction, the same distance. All these vectors are equal, okay? now. Then you have a part of a rotation. So it is as if you did this. First you translate this, then you rotate it. For instance, our brain can understand it like this. Rotate it like this, yeah? A rigid body rotation. And then distorted it. So once it got to this point, uh, it distorted it. Now, this doesn't mean that this is the sequence, the historic sequence. All these things could have happened at the same time. But for our brain now, we, we decompose the deformation into rigid body deformation, yeah, translation and rotation, and distortion. And the distortion here, you see here the distortion. Yeah, this is non-rigid. You can look at an internal reference system. You can take a, a different reference system, which is much easier, yeah? Like you take this system and put it here, and it's much easier to, to understand it uh, compared to the initial system that worked very well for the translation and rotation. So the idea is, the idea is that um, when we talk about strain, yeah, we talk about any change in shape with or without change in volume 
and this is strain, yeah? And that means that the relative positions of particles inside the rock body has changed, the relative position. When it's translation, the relative position doesn't change. When it's strain, it changes, okay? So again, just to get familiar with this way of seeing things, because now you'll start looking at rocks in a different way. You'll think, what happened to this volume of rock? Yeah, that's the idea. So here is a very simple example. Also from the textbook, we go to uh, Scandinavia in Northern Europe, and this is Norway, yeah, Norway. So on the Western side of Scandinavia, there, there is an old mountain range uh, from the Paleozoic called the Caledonian uh, mountain range. And here you see there is a, a block, uh, a block of rocks, pretty big. You see, this is 50 kilometers. So it's a big block of rocks that came, yeah, came from elsewhere, was uh, translated, basically, was translated. So most of the deformation here is translation, non-rigid body. There is some, there is some uh, strain here, but this is concentrated at the, at the base of the block where there was a lot of distortion, you can imagine. But it got translated and this is called a nap, a nap. And when we talk about orogens in the second part of the course, in the tecto uh, when we discuss tectonics, um, we'll learn more about uh, naps. All right, so this is just as an example to see that we don't discuss these things just for nothing. You will be professionals and some of you will have to map certain regions to create a geologic map and to understand the tectonic history. Uh, and to understand the tectonic history, you have to infer what the components of the formation were. Yeah, that's the idea. All right, so let's introduce um, no, uh, <laughs> you asked me uh, why that happened. Well, that happens um, as a response of tectonic uh, forces, yeah, as a response of tectonic forces. In the orogenic belts, you have the development of low angle faults that are called thrust faults. Yeah, they are like reverse faults, but low angle, along which a section of the crust, of the upper crust, is transported on top of another section of the crust and this is like i am here in my office in the ep edificio the physics building uh, in the campus and here in front of me behind the the i think it's a q uh, building i think the the chemistry we have uh, the cerros the monserrate so this is the cordillera oriental and these rocks that are which, uh, that, that were deposited on the bottom of the sea, like the limestones here, were basically thrust, yeah, thrust on these thrusts, and that's how they got to be mountains. So th this is what I've shown you what happened with that part, that nap in the Caledonites. All right, so homogeneous, <laughs> you're welcome, Laura, homogeneous and heterogeneous deformation. So when we talk about the formation, we can think of it if it's homogeneous or not. Now, homogeneous has a definition so that we can understand this. And the definition is this. It says straight lines remain straight. So you deform the volume, but straight lines remain straight. Parallel lines remain parallel. And identically shaped and oriented objects, yeah, they will also be identically shaped and oriented after the deformation. So this is the idea. This is a volume of rock. You see it's, it has some fossils here, ammonites, uh, brachiopods. It has these fossils here. And maybe it has some dikes or something that goes through it, through the volume of rock. And it's undeformed. And here you have two ways of deforming this, simple shear, or pure shear, you squish it like this, yeah, pure shear. And what you see here, this is homogeneous deformation. So let's look at the definition. Straight lines 
remain straight. Parallel lines remain parallel, yeah? Now look at identically shaped, look at these ammonites, these two ammonites, and identically oriented. So the same orientation, the same shape, they have the same shape, of course, deformed, but when you compare the two, here in the deformed state, they have the same shape and the same orientation. So they have to have the same orientation. If it's not, then uh, uh, not the same orientation, then they will be different. So this is, I think, a, a concept that it's not difficult to understand, homogeneous deformation. So now we can understand heterogeneous deformation because heterogeneous deformation means straight lines will not be straight after the formation, parallel lines will not be parallel, yeah, and so on. So uh, the definition will not apply. Now, guess what? Nature is very complicated. The geological environment is very complicated. So in general, the deformation is heterogeneous. Yeah, that's what happens. So it's, it makes things more complicated for us when we are students and have to learn them. But we want to understand nature. And the idea is that our human mind can work by trying to basically divide the complex reality into parts that we can understand. And then you can divide a heterogeneous deformed region into little sectors of homogeneous deformation. For instance, here, this is what this example shows. So you look at this deformed square here, and it is basically heterogeneous because you see straight lines are no longer straight. So what happens is, the definition doesn't apply, it's heterogeneous deformation, but we can find a region, a region where you have this straightness, yeah? We have the parallelism preserved and so on, and we say in that sector, we can understand this as homogeneously deformed, yeah? So again, I'm, I'm showing you how the thinking goes, but in nature, you'll find things as being in general heterogeneous. So we divide the heterogeneous deformation into, into segments where we, we can see homogeneous deformation, and then we can understand better what happened. All right. Now, the same thing is explained here, but it's from the, the other textbook, yeah? So you can play this game with the a deck of cards, you know, playing cards, you play poker. Yeah? So the idea is you, when you have the deck, that's uh, how it is called in English. All these cards, one on top of the other nicely, it's called the deck of cards, like here. And you can, if you want, you can draw on, on the side these markers. And then you can take and slip each card, yeah, on top of the other card with the same same distance, yeah, very nice. And then this would be homogeneous deformation. But if you slip the cards, like with different uh, uh, translation vectors, and maybe laterally, now you get heterogeneous deformation. And you see what happens to the markers here, yeah. You no longer have straight lines. Um, what happens, and in this definition, it adds one more thing. It says, when you have homogeneous deformation, circles become ellipses. So this circle becomes an ellipse here, whereas here is no longer an ellipse, as you can see. Yeah, And in three dimensions, a circle, if it's homogeneous deformation, will become an ellipsoid, an ellipsoid. All right, so this takes me to something that you are already familiar. I will not insist too much here, but what I mean to say, in the same way that when we discussed about stress, yeah, we discussed about stress, and we, we, we discussed about how to understand the stress at a point, and we discussed about the stress ellipsoid, there's one way to understanding the stress at a point, in the same manner, when we talk about strain, we talk about the strain ellipsoid, yeah? And what it means, think about this. It means that if you have this 
the formation of a sphere into an ellipsoid. So the sphere became an ellipsoid. That means that the ellipsoid will have three axes, three principal axes. And you will have one axis along which there was more deformation and one axis along which there was uh, less deformation and one that was intermediate deformation. So that's the idea. And people, when they, especially in rock mechanics and uh, in Mechanica del Continuo, they use this to describe mathematically the strain. And in the textbook, you can see these descriptions, but I'm not giving them to you. I don't want you to, to be stressed with these things. If you want, you can read them for yourself. But I think that to understand intuitively the things, it's enough, yeah, this. So we talk about the strain ellipsoid, principal planes of strain, principal strain axis. And this principal strain axis means uh, principal stretches, yeah, along which there is stretching. Yeah, so the idea is that- Teacher, sorry. Yes, uh, David. So will the stress ellipsoid, if it happened to an object, you're telling us that the strain ellipsoid is like the, the thing that happens after it feels stress or I'm right. Well, the stress wrong. ellipsoid, yeah, I see. I, I was expecting this question. It is good you asked that, uh, it, David. Um, I think that um, they are similar as mathematical descriptions. And what happens is in a first approximation, you can imagine <laughs> where you can imagine in terms of Think about the stress ellipsoid, what it means, it shows you the, the principal stresses. So you have one maximum stress. And in a first approximation, in a simple case, let's say you have uh, a sphere, yeah, you have a sphere, and you, you apply a principal, maximum principal stress here, and intermediate here, and a, a small one here. What will happen? You will deform the sphere and get this strain ellipsoid which this small axis, yeah, the, the, the small axis, let's say, here is, you see the, the smallest axis, they put two here. It should be three here and two here because to my eyes, this is shorter. So let's say this is the shortest. So basically the shortest axis of the strain ellipsoid will coincide to the longest Will axis. be a consequence of the longest yeah, one. Yeah, it exactly, it's a, it's a main, Principal stress, right? You are right. So okay, that's the idea. Okay. You get it. Yeah. So uh, that's the idea in a first approximation for sure. Um, anyway, the reality is more complex because uh, what happens is that um, how to how to put it? We are not sure when we look at the formation what the state of stress is. You, I, you'll see at the end of this lecture. It is. Uh, the situations can be so complex and so many boundary conditions. You know about boundary conditions when you uh, learn about differential equations. So boundary conditions can be so uh, different that it's not such a direct relationship between the strain and the stress. There could be things that condition the evolution of the formation. But we'll see that. Don't worry. In a first approximation, uh, it's easy to think like this and it's not wrong. Now, here is one thing that says very interesting. Lines that are parallel with the principal strain axis are orthogonal uh, and were also orthogonal in the undeformed state. Yeah, so basically anything that is parallel to this axis, obviously it's orthogonal, yeah, because it, these are orthogonal, but they were also orthogonal in uh, the undeformed state. All right, so that much about the strain ellipsoid. I wanted you to, to be aware of it, yeah? Um, now, here are some types of strain. There are some terms, terminology, and you, when you read a text in geology, you will see the author say, talking about, for instance, uniaxial contraction. So you have to understand what it means, yeah? What it means. It's like learning a, a new language, yeah? It's a code for understanding the physical meaning. So look at this here, uh, ignore this, look only at these two. This, you see the three 
three principal axes, X, Y, and Z, yeah? So what it, it tells you here, yeah? Uniaxial strain, it says contraction or extension along one of the principal strain axes, only along one, and there is no change in the other two. So you can imagine what happens here, you see, there is no deformation in this direction or in this direction, so horizontally, there is no deformation. The deformation is only on the vertical. And we call this uniaxial contraction or compaction. Yeah, which makes sense, it's uniaxial. Uniaxial means one axis, okay. And contraction, yeah, it's contraction or compaction. Now, obviously, when you look at this, and this is basically not changing horizontally, you must have a volume reduction. Now, why, why are we learning this? Because this is what happens, you see, physical compaction of porous sediments and tufts near the surface. So sediments get accumulated, they have fluid in between the grains. The fluid is expelled, is expelled because of the weight of the new sediment that comes above it. The fluid is expelled and there is basically compaction of the sediments and by compaction they become sedimentary rocks so you see we are learning these things because they reflect the processes that happen in the geological environment so porous sediments tufts the tufts are uh, formed yeah from uh, volcanic ash um, and the idea is that the fluid leaves the pore space and the pore space becomes smaller the pore volume yeah so and you have compaction now you can have, so this is physical, a physical process. A chemical process is chemical compaction when the minerals recrystallize. They basically uh, are dissolved at the boundary between minerals, they are dissolved and some of the uh, fluid carries the atoms outside of this system. And the compaction is chemical, yeah? You have some recrystallization there. So these things happen. Now, chemical compaction, for instance, in metamorphism, yeah? physical compaction in sedimentary basins. And the other option would be to extend it. Yeah? And this is called uniaxial, one axis, and ext extension only along this axis, with no change horizontally, you see here. And this is expansion, basically. It's an expansion. When this can happen, imagine a volume of rock and it create some fractures. There are some fractures that form, they are called tensile fractures. So basically there is little volume of, you know, empty added, yeah? And basically you have extension. And uh, these uh, fractures can be filled by solutions that precipitate calcite or quartz, yeah? And that's how you see the little veins. So you see a volume of rock with these veins of quartz, for instance. And that volume of rock suffered uniaxial extension, for instance, yeah? And there was um, a change of volume, the volume increased. So that's the idea. Okay, now let's look at these other three situations that, that uh, happen. So we are basically changing a bit and increasing the, the level of complexity here. So here is something called plane strain. Plane strain means, you see, the formation along this vertical direction. And as a result of this, there is an expansion in this horizontal direction, but only in one direction horizontally. So uh, let's say the other uh, direction, the rock cannot expand or the material cannot expand, something blocks it. So plane strain means you have one plane here where the formation exists, created by these two axes, vertical and horizontal. So when you, when you hear someone about talking about plane strain deformation, that means that the deformation happened along two axes, yeah? Along two axes, and there is one axis along the, which there was no deformation, yeah? So that is the terminology, plane strain. So once you understand this, you see it's not very difficult because it makes sense, it's logical what they want to say with these words. All right, let's look at these two these two it says axially symmetric extension so you see what happens here here we had extension but there was no change no change 
horizontally. Yeah? Now, deformation. Now, normally, when you stretch something, yeah, you stretch something, it would it will thin. Yeah. So basically, you you see what happens when you you are, you have equal deformation in all directions, and that's why it says axially. So the uh, axially means around this axis, yeah, where you have the extension around this axis, the deformation is symmetric, yeah? So it's uniform extension or axially symmetric extension or the opposite of it, you can have flattening, yeah? You squish something and you flatten it and it expands. It expands similar in uh, equally in all directions, um, perpendicular to the, uh, to the uh, flattening, yeah? So again, all these are particular cases of the most general situation, which we call three-dimensional strain, which means that you can have a deformation of a certain length along one axis and different deformations along the other two uh, principal axes of strain. So that's the idea, okay? So three-dimensional strain is the most general, and we have these particular situations. And our mind works well with particular situations, with simplifying things. So when we can decompose the deformation in these particular situations, it's kind of easier for us. Yeah? So that's the idea. That's why I'm introducing to you all these aspects. All right. Now, there is a different type of strain, which we call the volumetric strain. Yeah, Volumetric strain. And uh, that means that the volume changes and the obvious it, it, it leads to distortion. Yeah. And you see the difference. I mean, this is a text here, but this image is worth all the words here because I don't have to read the words because you understand from these images what happens. This is an isotropic volume change. So you see it basically uh, the, the change in shape happens in such a way that is equal in all directions. That's what means isotropic. Isotropic means uh, the same in all directions, yeah? So it's equally shortened or extended in all directions. So a cube will still be a cube, yeah? That's what happens. So you don't change the actual shape, yeah? You don't change the actual shape. But still, if you think about it, any two particles, this one and this one, their relative positions have changed because they got closer one to another, yeah? So you have non-rigid body deformation. That's why it is strain. Whereas anisotropic, as you can see here, see here in the case of compaction, yeah? <laughs> um, uniaxial contraction here. We have a, a volume change, yeah? We have a volume change here. You see from the cube to the uh, parallelepiped here. And this is basically changing the shape. So this is why it's an isotropic volume change. All right. So you have here all the definitions. So all the building blocks of understanding the formations when you look at the rock. Now, this is something I already introduced to you, but this is some text. So basically, we talk about simple shear. You see this kind of uh, of the uh, formation. It is a, an idealization of our mind, simple shear, how we um, deform things like this. And here it says something interesting. It says simple shear is a special type of constant volume. So constant volume, there is no change in the volume. And here is interesting, plane strain deformation. So plane strain deformation means that there is no deformation yeah, along the axis perpendicular to this figure, yeah? So that's why it's plane strain. It happens only in, in this plane. And here you see we squish things, and this is called pure shear deformation, pure shear deformation. And again, again, uh, is a plane strain with no volume change. So you see two-dimensional strain only along this axis and this axis, X and Y, Perpendicular, nothing happens. However, in the geological literature, some geologists extrapolate and extend this simple model, extend it to three-dimensional. So they, when they squish this thing, 
they consider that it it deformed in one direction and in the other as well and they still call it play they, they still call it pure shear yeah pure shear so so you'll encounter this some geologists will talk about pure shear but actually it is a three-dimensional deformation yeah but simple shear and pure shear if you will like uh, structural geology and tectonics you'll under you'll encounter a lot this terminology yeah now um <laughs> two more terms coaxial deformation and non-coaxial deformation now coaxial coaxial means that the principal axis principal axis of strain during deformation have not rotated they are still the same and we, you can imagine when you do and squeeze this thing like this the principal axis of deformation they remain constant and this is called coaxial deformation now here what happens the axis of deformation that i'll show you in another slide they rotate they rotate and it is called non-coaxial deformation this is terminology i know it is a lot for you and when we'll have the uh, uh, test you know you have the books in front of you with all the definitions so you don't have to memorize them all all you need to do is understand what it means you don't have to memorize yeah because once you understand then you know what you see yeah and then you learn the terms with time you learn you learn the terms so here is an example applied to geology we have something called uh, fabric it could be for instance little uh, certain minerals in the rock like mica for instance yeah or a certain structure in the rock um, you can see what happens here uh, what happens when you apply simple shear yeah simple shear and pure shear so you can see an initial sphere is deformed into an ellipsoid yeah into an ellipsoid so this is how what is called foliation which is a fabric in a rock yeah how it forms yeah you see through simple shear and through pure shear now obviously you can get better a better developed fabric through pure shear deformation in this case than through simple shear deformation it's just an example so that you can see that all these terms that we learn now people will apply them to the things they see in the rocks yeah to different markers in the rocks that's the idea just to give you an example another example now we go into the field of tectonics which is as i told you it's more interesting you like this yeah because here already you can think about wow you know we look at the whole uh, at the whole lithosphere here you see the crust and the lithospheric part of the upper mantle yeah so below there is the asthenosphere so you learned about regions that suffered extension and the formation of basins yeah the formation of basins from intracontinental basins in the continents to oceanic basins so the idea is to understand mechanically how the extension happens yeah how is the lithosphere extended basically and you you have here two end models two end models you'll see them in many books if you like geology and you start reading geology you'll see them in many books and these two uh, models are pure shear or sisala uh, pura and simple you can see so basically when you have the pure shear yeah the pure shear deformation it as if you extend this thing and it deforms uniformly as you can see in the upper crust it develops all these normal faults and these blocks get rotated yeah uh, and this is called a, a horst and graben yeah um system but anyway this we talk about it later so you see the symmetry here of pure shear the formation yeah the basically the lower crust and the part here of the um of the little of the mantle it's considered that they 
that they flow, yeah, to fin, that they flow through this mechanism of pure shear. For a simple shear, you see the, the development, basically, of a main shear uh, surface, like a fold along which extension happens, yeah? So we will discuss about these things later in the tectonics, you'll see. But just to give you an example that people use these models, yeah, starting from the very mechanical images that we've seen to understand the deformation at the big, big scale, yeah, of uh, the lithosphere. So here is something interesting. It says example of scale dependence of pure and simple shear concepts. And what I'm trying to see here is basically if we have this uh, this extension that we can describe as pure shear, yeah, like this, like in this model here. This is taken from the uh, North Sea. You see North Sea. Um, if you look at this scale as all this image, you as a tectonicist can say, well, this region suffered pure shear deformation. So the extension happened through pure shear because it is symmetric. You see how it is. But if you go and look at the scale of this fold here, yeah, of this fold here, or this fold here, you'll see that locally the deformation here is taken. Yeah. So you see, there is no deformation here. No deformation here. The deformation happened along these folds. So these folds are, are like shear zones. And, and the deformation here, you see the shear zone is a zone. And in between the zone is concentrated all this deformation. So how are you going to describe the mechanical model of deformation there is through the model of simple shear. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying that we as geologists learn to think at different scales of observation. Yeah. And we have to ha be very flexible in our thinking because the models, yeah, the mechanical models that we learn, they are rigid. They are kind of fixed. This is a model. How are we going to understand the deformation? Well, it depends on the scale. Yeah. So that's the idea how it appears to us. So it might seem strange to you, but many things in our reality uh, are strange, like quantum physics, yeah? It's very strange, but still it describes the reality and we are describing the reality here. That's the idea. Now, this might seem very complicated to you, but it doesn't. The reason I put here progressive is you remember at the beginning of the class, I told you that you can look at the formation, the initial state and final state, or the history of the formation, how it got from here to here. So progressive means looking at the history of the formation and progressive simple shear, progressive pure shear. Look at this. I mean, it makes sense. This is the initial sphere, yeah? And this, this is a final ellipsoid, you see, obtained through simple shear deformation. But progressively, what you did, you deformed this sphere, yeah, initially to this ellipsoid and then this ellipsoid and this ellipsoid and so on. So this is a progressive, progressive simple shear. And as you can see, as you can see, the axis of this ellipsoids or ellipses in this case, because we look at the 2D image, the axes are not the same. They get rotated. So this is what non-coaxial deformation means, yeah? So I, I promise you that I'm gonna show you uh, this. So now you can see, we can see the history and we can see that the axes were rotated, yeah? As we deformed this sphere through simple shear. Whereas when we apply pure shear and we squish this, the, the sphere here, yeah, we squish it, you see what happens. The history of the formation, we got an initial ellipse and then an ellipse that is flatter and flatter and flatter up to the last ellipse that is represented here. But the axis of the formation, the principal axis, they stay the same, yeah? So they, they don't rotate. So this is called 
coaxial deformation. So, okay, this is explained in the text here, but I'm more interested that you understand and you see that these concepts actually are not very difficult. Yeah, once you can picture in our minds, we can picture in our minds what happened. So, this is just repeating, is just repeating what I've shown you. It's from the our textbook and it shows you simple shear. So you see how the ellipses, how the ellipses kind of rotate and the principal axis of deformation, which are the dashed line here, you see S1, S3 here, how they change their orientation yeah, with deformation. And they don't change it here. But also what this figure introduces, it introduces these lines, like random lines. One is called L, one is called M. And it, it tries to show you what happens to these lines. And what happens here is a bit complex because it says, it says line L, line L at first shortens. So initially it gets shorter and then it lengthens. So initially you get it shorter and then it, it lengthens with the deformation. So there is a zone here that initially suffers kind of compression and then it suffers extension during the progressive simple shear. So you see how complicated it is because we, we look at the volume of rock and you think, what is the history of deformation? And obviously there were some zones in the, that volume that initially got extended and then they, or got compressed and then they got extended, yeah? So that's the idea. So this introduces a bit this complexity because it tries to show you this. And again, this might seem, oh, this is crazy. It's the same thing, uh, but these people took in this book, Fossen, put more lines, one, two, three, four, five, six, so that you can see what happens to each of them, yeah? What happens to each of them? and it shows you the sectors. So the sector here, when you start doing these deformations of simple shearing, this sector, the, the cream color sector, suffers instantaneous shortening, and this is being stretched. And then, then this is a sector that gets stretched uh, and, uh, sorry, shortened and stretched and so on. So you can, see what happens during the formation with all these sectors and with all these lines, yeah? So there is a change there. So, so it is a bit complex what happens, yeah? yeah? You can see the complexity. It's not very intuitive, but this is what happens, yeah? In this non-coaxial deformation history. Uh, whereas when we have, sorry for this, uh, I didn't mean, uh, I, I hope it will, um, Go away, sorry. Uh, okay. So here we have progressive pure shear. And with progressive pure shear, it, it is easier to understand, yeah? Because progressive pure shear, you see the symmetry, you see basically the zones that get shortened and the zones that get stretched. So this coaxial deformation for our brain, for our mind is easier to grasp, yeah? But that's why we are looking at these things so that you get a feel for it. And then finally, uh, there is something that is a combination of the two. Yeah, a combination of, of uh, simple shear and pure shear, and it's called sub-simple shear. Just for you to, to have an idea, yeah? You, will, you don't have to remember to memorize these things. <laughs> no, not at all. Don't, don't, don't worry about this, yeah? Uh, and as a conclusion, yeah, as a conclusion, what people try to show here is in that three these uh, models of simple shear deformation, you see, pure shear deformation, and something in between in the central column, as you start deforming things, you can see the various sectors that get compressed and extended. And then you get sectors that initially get compressed and extended and so on and how the evolution of these sectors is with with uh, progressive deformation so again this is not something that you have to memorize or whatever i just want you to understand what this 
by reading by reading uh, the explanation here to understand what it tries to show because you will be scientists you are scientists you are forming yourself as scientists so what means is when we try to to communicate and to convey our information and the results of our research how can we do it and for instance in this way this is a cool way of trying to show us the evolution of the formation and what happens with different uh, parts of the volume of rock that we look at yeah so during progressive deformation so for you take it as just an example yeah just an example of how we in science have to devise ways of basically conveying yeah conveying our observations yeah so that's the idea so don't get scared about this so here is three dimensional deformation yeah so basically um in three dimensions here are shown different situations how uh, for instance when you when you have extension yeah you have extension you see along the x axis you have shortening along the outer axis yeah this is the initial state and this is let's say the final state now the same can happen along the z axis or the y axis or when you have flattening you can see these three situations or here you have for instance pure shear yeah so these are all examples of coaxial strain coaxial it's easier for us to grasp for instance now this is uh, from the Fossen textbook it is a very complex figure very complex and it is the result of a lot of research you can imagine that many people in time worked to understand the combination of these situations the combinations as you can see of uh, different types of deformation when we have shearing we have like simple shearing pure shear different combinations of them and again it, this is not something that you have to memorize i just want you to contemplate it to contemplate it and to see that here you have some some words you 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 have some words that say lateral extrusion lateral shortening sub simple shear classic trans tension classic transpression now you will encounter the the word transpression for instance when we talk about bends yeah bends in the shear zones so you have some faults that are strike slip faults strike slip yeah and like San Andreas Fault in California, it causes a lot of trouble, earthquakes and so on. Uh, San, uh, like the Anatolian Fault in Turkey, again, major strike slip faults. But these faults are not perfectly straight, yeah? Not perfectly straight. They have bends, yeah? They curve at some point, they turn like this. And in those bends, depending on the configuration, you'll see, you can have something called transpression. And when we talk about tectonics, it will be very logical to you, like why it happens. But when you look at the rocks there, what kind of deformation suffered, you will see that you, you go on this diagram and you'll say, oh, we are in this situation. So we can understand the deformation as a combination of these models, for instance, yeah? So again, this is a figure for you to have an idea to contemplate not to memorize not to stress yourself with it yeah i just try to to show you why structural geology is a very challenging field for all of us yeah to understand it yeah that's the idea it's not that it is a difficult i try not to make it a difficult uh, subject in uh, where in university I'm trying to, to show, to introduce you to it, yeah? So that you feel a bit of uh, challenge, but also a bit of interest in how our mind can understand the very complex reality. All right, now we are getting close to finishing. So the final part of the only two slides uh, is this, the relationship between stress and strain. And David asked me the question, yeah? 
And in a first approximation, I said, yes, yes. But the idea is that the relationship between stress and strain is not that straightforward. It's that straightforward forward in the most ideal case. So as you can see, you have question marks here. The question marks uh, say, okay, if we know the state of stress, what will be the deformation? And maybe it's easy to understand, for instance, if we are given a volume of rock, how this is going to get deformed, yeah? But what this figure tries to show, it sh shows like this. It says, let's go through this. It says, if you know the orientations of the principal stresses, that is not sufficient to predict the resulting deformation, you see? So for instance, in a perfectly isotropic medium, yeah, perfectly isotropic, no variations in any direction, yeah, which in general doesn't exist in nature, <laughs> yeah, you will get what's called here a pure shear deformation, which you can understand, it's logical, yeah, if you do this uh, thing to, um, to this rectangle, yeah, this is what you're gonna get. Now, the thing is, I told you, boundary conditions, there are things in the environment, in the medium, that condition the direction of the evolution of things, yeah? in our case of deformation. So for instance, instance, a plane of weakness, yeah? a plane of weakness shown as a shear plane. Yeah? So it's a plane of weakness. That is a boundary condition. So you see, if you have this boundary condition under the same stress regime, under the same stress um, conditions, you get a different deformation. In this case, it's called sub-simple shear, a combination of pure shear and simple shear. And finally, finally, um, it says, um, if you have in D here, let's see, where is D? Um, yeah. In the special case where the angle between sigma one and the weak plane, yeah, between sigma one, you see, and the weak plane is 45 degrees, a simple shear could result. So it might seem very complex and complicated to you and so on, but the idea is that we are all equal. We are human beings, we have our mind, and we try to understand nature. And then, we try to understand how come that the under what conditions the deformation that we see ended up like this. Yeah, what were the initial conditions of stress and so on? And what this thing tries to show is that it's not that straightforward. It's very complicated because you have all these boundary conditions. Yeah. Now here, let's look at the geology here. Yeah, you see these pebbles. You see these pebbles and strained pebble, pebbles, deformed pebbles, yeah? So deformed pebbles, you see this, let's say, in a conglomerate, you look at a conglomerate and you see these deformed pebbles and you can kind of wonder, well, what were the conditions? What was the mechanism of deformation? And you can see here, you can see here, if you had, you, you don't see it here, but maybe you look above, you look below and you find two folds, yeah? And you see these uh, two uh, uh, shear planes, and then you say, oh, this is a shear zone, okay? These two planes are like this relative to, to these pebbles. And you say, oh, this is a shear zone. So this initial, yeah, initial uh, nice pebble, spherical pebble, got deformed into a shear zone through simple shear, and now we see it as an ellipsoid, for instance, yeah? Whereas you might look around, yeah, you might uh, look, look around and you, you might realize that they, these pebbles got squished, yeah? It was a lot of weight above them and they got squished. Uh, there, was, there is a layer that is very rigid above them, a layer very rigid below them. And there is the possibility for deformation to happen laterally. So then they got squished through pure shear. So you learn something geological here. 
when you go in the field, we cannot go now, but when we go in the field, we look at rocks at the outcrop, that is a florimento, but then we have to understand the outcrop in the general context beyond what we see. And that is very tricky, but important in geology, because that's why we do mapping. That's why from an outcrop, we might not understand anything. We might have two different hypotheses, and they are both good until we can see something else, until we can see the boundary conditions that led to what we see. All right. So this is my theoretical uh, presentation for today. I told you it's going to be a bit dry. Please excuse me for this. You will have to be well prepared as geologists. So you need to be aware of all these aspects. Yeah. So I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for you. Please read these sections. Yeah, you see uh, this uh, chapter four here has many sections, but I'm giving you some introduction. Yeah. And from this one, I'm giving you only some of them, not the ones with all complications, a lot of mathematics and so on. No, they, these are the kind of readable ones that will make sense to you. All right. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to stop this. Please, if you have questions, ask them. If not, Feliz tarde a todos. Yeah. And I'm going to see thank you. Thank you very much, teacher. You thank you, teacher. Welcome. Feliz tarde. Feliz tarde, David. You are welcome. All of them are very welcome. It is my pleasure to be here with you. Believe me. Yeah, so muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a todos, Laura. Muchas gracias a todos que escriben aquí en uh, <laughs> María uh, también. Um, thank you very much. Gracias, Jorge. Hasta luego. Hasta luego, Juan. Uh, con gusto. Uh, thank you, Valentina. <laughs> See you. Bye.